Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us at day two of uh, From Classroom to Boardroom, a virtual event series addressing issues of race and equity in the workplace in Charlottesville and in communities across the country. Uh, we're especially excited for today's session as it marks the first of three collaborative programs with the United Way of Greater Charlottesville, a uh, critical partner in bringing this program to life and an instrumental organization in our community. Today's panel is titled, The Wealth Gap is Rising, What Can We Do About It? And I'm thrilled to introduce um, our moderator, Robbie Respetto, Executive Director at the United Way. Robbie, I'll turn things over to you. Thanks so much, Ben, for having us uh, here today on this important panel and this important series of Tom Tom. So like Ben said, Robbie Respetto, President of the United Way of Greater Charlottesville. And I am joined today by friends and colleagues. Um, Yolanda Harrell is here. She's the President and CEO for New Hill Development. Barbara Hutchinson's here. She's the VP of Community Impact here at the United Way of Greater Charlottesville. And lastly, um, and most importantly, Ridge Schuyler, Dean of Community Self-Sufficiency for Piedmont Virginia Community College. So great panel today. Um, we're gonna to be talking about the wealth gap is rising. What can we do about it? Each one of these panelists has a lot of background and experience in uh, this issue and some innovative ways of, of handling it and working collaboratively um, together. Just sort of one thing to take into consideration as we move through the discussion today, it will be conversational and we're hoping that if you have questions, you put them in the chat session and I'll do my best to answer them kind of as we move through so we don't have to wait till the very end and do a Q&A, but we can kind of keep it part of the conversation. Um, so without further ado, we'll get going. So um, my first question uh, for the group today is to share background on how your organization is working to address this challenging community trend of a wealth gap that continues to increase here in our community. And I'm gonna go ahead and start with you, Yolanda. Thanks, Robbie. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. So New Hill Development Corporation is uh, seeking to work with um, the community to address this uh, critical, critical uh, need in terms of uh, wealth creation, you know, the ability to gain more opportunities uh, and ability for individuals to be able to move along the financial spectrum. Um, and the way we're uh, seeking to do that is through um, our financial capabilities pillar. We have three areas of focus. We have financial capability, we have economic development, and we have housing. We believe that those three things together uh, allows for individuals to be able to get to the place, see the goals and the dreams that they have for themselves and for their family um, uh, and their ability to create the level of wealth that they want for their families. And so um, our goal is to work with them uh, on, on that path and to walk with them on that path and to, to help to enhance the skills that they currently possess and to uh, introduce new knowledge um, that, um, that they may need need to, to gain access to in order to reach their desired goals. Excellent, thanks for sharing, Yolanda. Um, and Barbara, talk a little bit about what United Way is doing around um, the wealth gap. Certainly, and it's nice to be here as well. So the United Way has just finished a strategic planning process and created a five-year plan. And we actually have five-year goals that are focused on equity. So for example, in our financial stability impact area, our goal is to help 1,800 families increase their income to above a survival income. And how we define a survival income is via the orange dot report uh, that states a family of three must earn at least $45,000 a year in our community just to afford basic necessities of life or again, survival income. We've also created a very specific sub goal of helping 133 black families increase their income to above again, that survival income. After examining that, however, we looked at our programs and what we're doing and what we believe we think we can do. And we've changed that goal now because we think we could probably help closer to 500 black families increase their income. And so how do we do that? Uh, first of all, looking at our programs. So for example, we have an early learner scholarship program that focuses on early ed, but also provides uh, roughly $10,000 a year to a parent in order that they continue to work and have high quality early childcare for their children. We also have a program that's been around for only two or three years, our family investment program. 
And again, that's in collaboration with other nonprofits, partners who are providing significant financial coaching to a family and are able to help them construct an action plan that would lead to uh, increasing income. And we come in and help fund milestones on that plan. So we might help them uh, repair a car or buy a, a reliable used car. We might help pay living expenses while a parent achieves a certification program at PVCC to gain a promotion at work. Or we might help them pay off debt as in a, in a, in a manner such that they can increase income, particularly high interest debt. So it's access to affordable capital in a way. And then we also look at gaps in services in the community. And one of those we started four years ago at a table again with Ridge and Liza Borges of uh, Carter Myers Associates. And just in the past year, we've created a brand new program, Driving Lives Forward. And Driving Lives Forward has several components, one of which is to uh, provide a market rate loan uh, to a family so that they can afford to purchase a reliable used vehicle Carter Myers Associates finds and, and inspects that reliable used vehicle, and then Virginia National Bank processes the loan on behalf of the United Way, who deposits funds in the bank to back the loan. And so we um, ha just took in our fourth client uh, in that program, and I believe that's going to be very successful because it's, again, creating that access to capital that many families lack. We're also looking at aligning our grant making uh, to include that focus on equity and helping our nonprofit partners in that effort. Uh, we've undertaken equity grants specifically, uh, for example, partnering with the Minority Business Alliance to provide um, grants to uh, help fund improvements to a business prior to COVID and, and then post COVID as COVID assistance uh, to help keep them on their feet. And then we undertake similar uh, work with our financial resiliency task force, our early ed task force, et cetera. And I think probably the most important thing I could say about all of that is it's not anything that we do by ourselves. It's in collaboration with our other nonprofit partners in the community, because I believe the disparities that we see in our community are far too great for any of us to do it on our own. Well, speaking of which, Rich, can you share um, what the network to work approach is and, and how that sort of dovetails with your other partners here today? Sure. So first of all, you know, uh, it's great to be here with uh, with my fellow panelists who are uh, partners with us at network to work We rely on New Hill and their Operation Hope program to provide that financial capability and coaching that is so important. And we, of course, uh, look to the United Way to help us with uh, child care scholarships and with uh, transportation assistance. So it's great to share a panel with such great friends and partners. Um, you know, our focus on, on racial equity, you know, starts with the idea that we have to be as intentional about eliminating poverty as we have been as a nation in creating it. And part of that intentionality is looking at what is the source of the racial wealth gap and while there are many, many sources, um, the Cleveland Fed recently said that, that the root cause of the, the racial wealth gap, which nationwide um, shows that a white family has 10 times more assets than a black family, um, which is just a, it's just a crime and, and it didn't happen by happenstance, um, but that the, the root cause of racial inequity um, is unequal labor income, that we literally do not value the labor of our black neighbors. And so Network to Work is focused on how do we identify uh, people who've been intentionally left behind in our economy and connect them to uh, jobs and careers that lead to family sustaining wages and beyond. And we do that primarily through a network of neighborhood-based connectors to whom we feed that job information and they stop and think, who do I know that would be good at that? So we're taking those economic opportunities that surround us and and putting it into the hands of neighborhood-based connectors, the glue that holds communities together so they can stop and think, who do I know that would be good at that job and reach out to people who otherwise are overlooked or disconnected and get them into those jobs that pay the family sustaining wages. And using that neighborhood-based model, um, I'm happy to report that 56% of the job seekers served by Network to Work, and that's over 1,070 now, 56% of those job seekers are black. And, mm -hmm. and so... I, I think we are reaching out 
um, to the folks who've been left behind, but we, we got to do more of it and we got to do it better. Excellent. Good point. And, and Rich, just briefly, you talk a lot about the equity line and the orange dot report. Can you just mention what that is? Yep. So, you know, we've been tracking for years since 2011, when the very first orange dot report, we've been tracking the percentage of families in our region that, that make less than a family sustaining wage, which Barbara just mentioned. And, and according to our most recent report, it's 17% of the families in our region don't earn enough to be self-sufficient. So that's nearly one out of every five. But looking deeper, you can see that that struggle is not equally shared. So while it's 17% of all families, 35% of black families make less than $35,000 a year compared to 14% of white families. Mm -hmm. um, it is an income disparity that leads to the wealth gap. And it is that income disparity that we really have to be intentional about tackling. Absolutely. So this question is for you, Yolanda, kind of following up on what Ridge just shared. What, so building uh, wealth in the Black community um, is behind the work of your organization. Um, where did the inspiration come from um, and how did you kind of formalize the mission of your organization? So I, I think I, I will say this. From a personal perspective, when I first moved to Charlottesville, it's been about 13 years ago now, I came here as an employer. And so I got a chance to see uh, from that perspective of what my team members were going through, um, especially when I would want to say, offer them a, a, a pay increase, but that pay increase was maybe only gonna be two or $3. Um, and yet they would turn it down because of what it could do financially to them um, uh, in terms of all of the other uh, supportive services that they may have had to allow them to survive in Charlottesville. And I thought that that was just the like, but you've done a great job. And this is how, you know, I'm supposed to give you a pay increase when you do a great job. And this is part of how we say thank you and, and recognize your hard work. And so that was very, um, you know, odd to me that that there's a system that, that existed that essentially trapped individuals um, and prevented them from being able to realize the level of success that they are supposed to realize for the efforts that they're putting in. And so then you kind of spring it forward and, and just doing a number of work in the community and uh, just coming to understand the challenges with the history of our community. Uh, when you had during urban renewal in the 60s, uh, a systematic approach of going about uh, getting rid of black neighborhoods and, and just destroying the connections. And of course, at that time you had uh, covenants and deed restrictions um, that said that, okay, black businesses can exist in black neighborhoods, but then if you go around and you destroy the black neighborhoods, well, then that proves to be challenging then to continue to operate back black businesses. And, and many uh, of us that are from, or people that are from the Char uh, Charlottesville area know uh, specifically of Vinegar Hill that was destroyed and that was raised. Um, and so you had a number of black families that were in the middle of paying a mortgage on a home when eminent domain was declared and their homes were taken from them. And you had other community members that uh, were in that area as well um, that were then moved, that did not have the ability to move away or move into other housing someplace else that then got, uh, that were moved into public housing. And then over time uh, for some, They've, they've become trapped in that, in that cycle. And so, um, the, you know, again, that as a, a member uh, coming that was new coming to this community, learning that history, but then as a black person in general and, and understanding from living in other com communities, the struggle, that there had to be something that we um, could potentially do to, to be a part of um, helping move the needle in our community. And so not to sit back and say what others should be doing, but what should we be doing? And to be part of the solution and not just angry about the problem. And so that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to, to, to create something where we could feel like we were contributing in a way that was meaningful, but also in a way that demonstrated that black people are quite capable of doing for themselves um, and, and helping one another. Um, and so that it also helps to shift some of that power dynamic as well of that is often seen in the black community where there are white community members that are doing for or doing to, but not doing with. Mm -hmm. and, um, and wanted to ensure that there was um, 
this shared uh, approach to how we move forward together and that it's about understanding, you know, where that individual is and where it is that they're trying to go. And then how do we tap the knowledge that exists out there in our existing community as well as communities beyond here in, in other parts of this nation and world to bring that information to, to bear in our community to say, this is how we can, we can create this pathway, this avenue to help you move along and reach the goal that you and your family has. Um, so, you know, that, you know, I hope that kind of answers the question mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of uh, what inspired us. Absolutely. And I think you hit it, you know, you have trust in the black community, right? You're a black woman, you've built relationships and that probably makes a huge difference in how you deliver services and how you work with the people uh, that participate in your programs. Um, well, and, and I'll be honest and say, not everybody, you know, I mean, yeah. we have some trust, right? Yeah. Trust is earned and not, mm -hmm. not necessarily given. And, um, and so there are still, because I'm also an outsider, I'm not from this yeah. community. And so there is that as well, that becomes a, a factor that um, mm -hmm. doesn't always lend itself for individuals to trust. But again, that's where we have to, um, we have to collaborate, we have to work with um, uh, other, you know, members of the, the black community that are from here that have more trust so that we can, we can, we can, you know, do our part to help move, um, the community forward in the way that it wants to move. Yeah. That's an excellent point. Uh, Ridge, I'd be curious to hear a little bit about your experience being a white leader, um, of a nonprofit organization and it's working in the black community and, you know, Yolanda just brought up issues of trust. Um, how has that played out for you, um, at Network to Work? Yeah, so, um, you know, it is such a, a, a fraught discussion. You know, I, I, like Yolanda, you know, didn't want to just sit back and watch and be angry with how things were. I wanted to roll up my sleeves and, and do something. Um, and when we started off Network to Work uh, and, and served our first 10 job seekers in 2014-15, our focus was really on people who've been left behind in the economy of whatever race. Um, and... But in our first group of 10 people, it was predominantly uh, black uh, job seekers that we were serving. And then over time, it has remained that um, as we've gone forward. And it, it is interesting to note that 56% that of our job seekers are black and 54% of the black families of Charlottesville make less than $35,000 a year. It is, um, it is just uh, an a, a intentional effort that has, that has set people back on their heels. And so we set out to address um, what we thought was, was a need to, to connect people to jobs and supports so they could uh, get family sustaining wages. But here we find ourselves, you know, I'm, a, I'm an old white guy um, working for an organization that is predominantly um, uh, working with uh, black job seekers. And, you know, I've had people look me in the eye and say, you know, it shouldn't be someone like you leading an organization like this. And I take that to heart. I mean, I, I think Yolanda is right. I think, you know, um, having a, a, a white leader of an organization that is working on uh, in concert with black job seekers is probably not how this is, sh should go over time. Um, I want to see what we have built um, take firm root and keep moving, but um, it is something that I wrestle with. You know, should I step back and let somebody else take over mm -hmm. and, and be very sensitive because there's just no way for me as a person to know, am I doing two as opposed to doing with? I feel like I'm doing with, mm -hmm. you know, um, we, are, we are very, <laughs> we are on the ground and responsive to our 1,070 job seekers, but I have no way of knowing what the dynamic is when they see that that the person who is leading that organization um, is an old white guy, and it is something that we have to contend with, and and I'm quite sensitive to it, and um, and you know I hope that we are we are doing what needs to be done, and so my answer to all of that is I just keep my uh, my focus on the job seeker. If I'm serving that job seeker well, mm -hmm. then everything else will play out as it should. And so I just remain completely focused on, are we serving job seekers well? And if so, then the chips will fall where they may. And if we're not, then I should be swept aside and somebody else who can do this better than I um, should take over the reins. 
Yeah. So that brings up a good question. So the client really is the center of all the work that we do. And we all agree on that. And maybe Barb, you can talk a little bit about that at United Way, um, the, the, the client profile that we serve, you know, how does, how does that land with the organization and sort of what are some steps we've taken with our inclusive excellence framework to, to address that demographic? Sure. So very similar to what you said, Reg, and that is um, if we look at any of our programs at, at any given time, roughly 70 to 80 percent of the clients that we serve are Black. Um, and I'll also just mention this real quickly, because since March, we've been involved as the disperser of a lot of COVID assistance funding, whether it be the SURF or CARES Act or our own COVID funding. And we see the disparities there because most of the folks that we're serving are black families, individuals, uh, black small businesses. And so I believe the pandemic has just deepened the disparities and, and really set us back. Um, so knowing that, uh, I think what is important to note is that uh, we have developed a focus on equity. And so we have adopted the inclusive excellence framework to begin our equity work. And that was originally developed for higher education, but after the events in Ferguson, Missouri, Dr. Kevin McDonald, who's currently the vice president of DEI at UVA, revised the framework to create a place where Ferguson could begin to implement rebuilding, um, looking at programs and services and redeploying them in an equitable manner. So, um, UVA has obviously adopted the IE framework as it's known, as has the Commonwealth of Virginia and now the United Way of Greater Charlottesville. So, and I'll note that we're also sharing it with other nonprofits in the area through a grant program. So we're really evaluating our organization across the inclusive excellence um, framework, which includes five dimensions. And we're, we're looking at all of our systems, our processes, our procedures, and making equity a priority within all of them. And what do we need to do to make equity the focus and what needs to change? So uh, again, um, we are starting to implement and have implemented changes in our leadership structure, for example, our board makeup, uh, staffing, uh, HR program, and now we're looking operationally at how we deploy that throughout our programs. And of course, um, one uh, priority is to bring our stakeholders to the leadership table. Uh, not just to survey them and ask them what they want or need, but to bring them to the leadership table to tell us what they need and what they want. And so an example would be in one of our um, early education programs where working uh, with private providers and with the local public preschool systems had start in the city and the county and have created what we call a coordinated enrollment program, a one-stop shop where someone, a parent may apply for a public preschool or private preschool through an online process. And in order to do that, we brought parents to the table that are representative of the community that we're serving. And it's a learning process. Uh, we learned a few things along the way. And now we're looking at doing that within each of our programs. How do we incorporate um, the stakeholders that we want to serve as part of our leadership. That's helpful. In terms of collaboration, because a lot of that, a lot of the discussion today is around how we collaborate and work together. Um, I'm going to pass it back to you, Rich, to talk a little bit about Network to Works tool, um, how that works in terms of connecting job seekers with employers, and how important sort of the wraparound services and these partnerships are um, in supporting families. Yep. So. Um... You know, at Network to Work, the networks that we are uh, working to uh, operate on behalf of job seekers is are the employer network. So who's got the job? Who are the employers that are honestly desperate to hand out money to people? Um, because they're there and, and, you know, they tell us every day we're having a hard time finding workers. So that's the employer network. The job seeker network, as I mentioned, is all the people who've been left behind in our economy grabbing them by the lapels and saying, man, there is a better job for you than the one that you've got, um, you know, and I think you'd be a great fit at it, you know, and that has been, you know, that, that conversation between that well-respected person in the community and the job seeker they're grabbing, that, that conversation has been so motivating for people, you know, the person who's working the part-time job, who somebody they know who, and respect looks at them and says, you know what, you are so great with people, have you thought of a career ladder in nursing? And seeing 
potential in somebody that they don't even see in themselves, powerful part of that job seeker network. And then finally, once that job seeker is identified and, the, and has chosen the job, bringing the whole provider network that exists in Charlottesville to bear on making sure that that job seeker can get from where they are to the job that they've chosen. And that provider network um, really does involve a lot of collaboration. And the piece of technology that we built with a local company called Tech Dynamism helps us uh, pull together those three networks. The, the employer posts the jobs in this piece of technology. That job then gets conveyed to the smartphone of these neighborhood-based connectors who stop and think, who do I know that would be good at that job? And then when the job seeker answers a series of questions, the machine automatically matches them to the provider in the community that's the best fit to help them overcome any challenges they may have. So it might connect them to the United Way for a child care scholarship or to the Driving the Lives Forward program. It might connect them to Operation Hope for some great financial coaching. It might connect them to the Charlottesville Free Clinic because if they're trying to get a job uh, as a certified nurse assistant to start their career in nursing and haven't seen a doctor in five years, somebody's got to look at those flat feet and make sure that they get attended to. So we have a network of about 40 providers who, um, are, uh, who get referrals through this mechanism and can close the referral loop so that job seeker can get tangible evidence that they are making progress along their pathway from where they are to that great job. And the piece of technology um, helps us unify those three networks and um and and it, it's a critical component and the and the partners that we have in our provider network are critical and it is how the 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 nonprofits and agencies are of our community can work together with the job seeker at the center it is the job seekers pathway every job seeker needs some different array of resources and supports and so we can individualize that job seekers pathway based on their specific needs their particular circumstances. I will say, while the technology is very cool, and, and it is, um, it is at the end of the day, just a tool. And a tool is only as good as the people who are wielding it. So the technology is only as good as the open doors of the employers who are looking for workers. It's only as good as the neighborhood-based people are trusted by their friends and neighbors. And it's only as good as the services that are delivered by the providers in our network. Those relationships really are at the key, but the technology helps bring those relationships to bear on behalf of individual people trying to climb the economic ladder and provide for their families. So Rich, can you give me, um, I mean, you've told me over the years, examples of, of how that actually plays out, like picking families up and having to get them to a doctor or, or helping people get to work because they don't have transportation. I mean, what are some of the challenges that you see in, in people just trying to scale economically? Yeah, I mean, you know, the transportation challenge is huge and, and um, and the the uh, the child care situation would be huge if it weren't for the United Way's child care scholarship program, which we have relied on from the very beginning when we first launched, you know, Network to Work. But to give an example, um, you know, there was a young man who was in our very first cohort of 10 people back in 2014-15 who um, was working part time at a fast food restaurant and got a stabilizing job at Farmington Country Club as a banquet server. It wasn't his his be all and end all job, um, but it was a great job with a great HR department that was willing to support him. He had no driver's license. He had no car. There was no bus that ran out to Farmington. Mm -hmm. So way back in the beginning, I was the transportation system. I would get up and, and take him to work because there just weren't any other options. And so that's how this started. And we, we, we focused on how do we fill that transportation void? And so working in the community, starting with the Charlottesville Police Department that donated a number of vehicles, we started a loaner fleet that said, well, you know, Nick may not have the amount of, have the money today to buy his own car, but he will tomorrow. And the tomorrow was after he got stabilized with the job at Farmington, he then went on to take technical skills training at PVCC to become a plumber's apprentice. And he's now making over $40,000 a year uh, mm -hmm. as he moves his way up the, the world of, of plumbing. Um, he can now buy his own car. And so he gave the loaner car back and now he's, he's driving his own car. And we've gotta be able to do things like that at scale in order to move people from where they are to where they're trying to go. And um, it's critically important. And, and I'll just say one last thing about transportation. Um, you know, uh, we work with job seekers who lose their jobs. You know, you, if you're late three times in some of our employers, mm -hmm. you get fired. 
um, mm -hmm. because you're unreliable. Mm -hmm. Well, what we know for a fact is that it's not the people who are unreliable. It's their car that's unreliable. It's their childcare that's mm -hmm. unreliable. It's not them, but we tend to blame the people rather than the circumstances. And then once we blame the people, we say it's your own fault and we wash our hands of them and say, so it's your own fault that you are where you are. And so I don't need to help you anymore. And we have got to uh, overcome that kind of institutional bias against people who are struggling in our economy. But transportation is a huge part of that. Absolutely. Um, Robin, uh, can I, can yes. I say something to kind of build on something that Ridge was saying? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things um, that I also want to make sure that we think about too, and we think about w wealth building and something that we think about um, considerably uh, at New Hill is that you know, you take the, the 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 individual that Ridge just spoke of, the gentleman. So now that gentleman is making more money, but what can also be something that can you know can also diminish that wealth building is that now he may be the person in his family that makes the most money, mm -hmm. yeah. and so the money, the new money that he's making, may not necessarily be all his own. And so, mm -hmm. for a lot of um, members of the black community. Not all, but for a lot of us, you know, some of us are first generation college graduates. And so, uh, you know, we may look, you know, this, this individual may be able to make a lot more money, but then we're not going to abandon our, the rest of our family that also are still experiencing emergencies or uh, life challenges. And so the money that we do make, is not fully our own. It is money that we're making for us and our loved ones. And so that money gets diminished in terms of its ability to specifically impact just us. Um, so I wanna make sure that that's brought up because for for us, we recognize that we know that to be true. And as a result, we have to think beyond, you know, once this person gets to this particular level, that is, does that mean that they are stable? It could, but in some ways it won't because of all of the other, um, you know, folks that may also still have some needs. And, and I think that that's, uh, that's pretty, pretty pervasive in our community. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, I, I would like to even, make, yeah. if I could make okay. a comment on yeah, that as well. Ahead. I think that's that's where nonprofits can come into the picture and be more nimble in their response, as opposed to a federally based social service program, for example, that's deployed through a locality. And so, for example, mm -hmm. in our early learner scholarship program, uh, we don't count other incomes at other revenue streams as income, much like the social pro social programs do. So we don't count child support as income. Um, we don't count an elderly parent living in the household against them. We count that for them. So if we have a 20 year old applying for a scholarship and her grandmother lives with her, we say, okay, that means you've got three people in your household. So your eligibility for our program increases mm -hmm. and she can stay in the program longer. So I think it's that kind of nimbleness um, and looking at the, um, where people are, you know, working with them where they are as opposed to what a piece of paper tells us it should be, mm -hmm. uh, makes a big difference. Yeah, I was, I was going to jump in and actually ask you, Yolanda, to comment on this, this issue of assets that in the Black community, there is not necessarily generations of built up assets that are going to be there to help with home ownership or help pay for a college education, things of the, that nature. It's almost like there's a catch up, right, that has to occur there. Um, and I'd be curious to, to hear your, your thoughts on that in terms of families that you're serving. So I'll start out by, by saying this, that so Ridge and I met when we were going through the dialogue on race series. Mm -hmm. And in that particular program, um, there's mm -hmm. this exercise that's called the privilege walk. And some of you may have done it if you participated in the program or in other programs. And, and basically there's a series of questions that are asked, you know, things like, um, it, you know, if you have a family member or a parent that graduated from college, take a step forward. You know, if you have, you know, someone that's ever, you know, received in your family a um, inheritance, you know, take a step forward, you know, if you, you know, and so it's a series of questions and in some questions you take a step back. And so what happened in our group, along with all the other groups across the, 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 the city, was that there was white people further down the road and black people were in the last bit. And then you had 
um, other community members, maybe the Jewish community or, you know, kind of in the middle. And so what was interesting in going through that exercise was that, you know, what, what was the difference makers? Well, the difference makers is how you start out and what is the history, you know, for your, your particular family, even though you individually may not be experiencing wealth right now, but if, you know, you have the ability to get land, you know, uh, passed down to you that you could then, you know, build your house on or that you, you know, your parent, uh, one of your grandparents passed away. And so now you have a place to live that is no longer, you know, um, has a mortgage on it, those kinds of things that those are difference makers in terms of how people are able to acquire assets and their ability to, to move forward in terms of um, building wealth for them and their family. And so when you, when you look at the history of our country and you look specifically at the history of this particular community, and we go back to that example of Vinegar Hill, well, if I was in the middle of paying my mortgage and you took my house from me, and now I've got to start over again. And you didn't give me, you know, hardly any money back for the house. So basically you've wiped out what I was doing in terms of wealth building. And probably because it was a black community, it probably wasn't valued at the, the right amount anyway, right? Because we know that that was a, a that it, well, it still is a practice in some communities, but you know, those are the types of things that happen. So even if I gained the asset of say of a home, but if, if it's redlined and so now it's valued at $50,000 or $100,000 less than that exact same home in a different community, well, then you've just cut my wealth, you know, from me. And so, um, and then when you look at in our community of just how, you know, the cost of living has just gone up significantly, just in a, in a few short years, it, there's a number of folks that are in our community that, you know, clients that we've even worked with that said, you know, if I was to sell the house that I'm in right now, I can't afford to buy a new house in this community because, it just is no longer affordable uh, for me. And so when you look at things like, you know, the average cost of a home is like $360,000 here, even that person that's making that $40,000 a year, can they afford a $360,000 home? Mm -hmm. So we, it's like we're perpetuating this cycle of it becomes harder and harder to attain assets. And so there, that's where creativity is going to have to come in. We're going to have to look at where can, where else can we get assets from that are that may not allow us to do it in this community. Um, there are obviously organizations like myself and other organizations that are out here trying to provide uh, opportunity for that to exist here, if, in terms of say a home or um, you know a business. But again, when you look at even in business, most of the spaces are owned. You know, right now, uh, for uh, with the, probably with the exception of one Black-owned restaurant, and we'll just use restaurant as an example because New Hill has been working a lot lately with the uh, with restaurants of uh, Black restaurants or uh, minority-owned restaurants during uh, this year with our community kitchen program. All of those uh, spots are in lease spaces, so at any point in time. If that landlord decides that they want to sell and they want to, or they want to redevelop it into something else, then that business has the ability to be put out of business. And mm -hmm. so it's so important that, you know, ownership is so important because we can control our destiny a little bit more, mm -hmm. but in our community it's still very difficult for that to happen, which is, you know, in large in part why, you know, our organization, one of the things that we're working on right now is a, a black business incubator where we own space where we could then kind of help control. And so, and then as we build new things, we wanna build in ownership opportunities for those businesses and for those uh, homeowners so that that way they can control their future and they have the ability to leverage their assets just like other members of our community. When their child is ready to go to college, if they wanna tap the equity in their home or if they you know, are using this small business that they don't wanna scale into something big, they just wanna say sustainable, business for them and their family, that they ought to be able to have that successfully in our community. And then they can save for that college education, or if they don't want to go to college, if it's for a trade or for helping their child start their own business. Those kinds of things are the things that we have to, to look at. And that's what makes it difficult in our community because our banks are saying, well, we can't give you that loan because you don't have the collateral. You don't have any assets that we can come after in the event that you don't, you know, make good on this loan. Um, 
but if I can't afford the assets that exist here, then when am I ever going to have the collateral necessary? So, you know, that's the work that we all are doing. Absolutely. And I think a, a sort of the last piece of that is just the debt piece, right? Like that's a big part of the equation. If you have a lot of debt, even if you're making a decent salary, you're still stuck, right? You can't get the, the, the loan or the credit or uh, whatever you need to kind of move ahead, um, especially around ownership. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and that kind of brings me to, uh, Barb, I'll toss this to you, our financial resiliency task force and the work we're doing around the matrix and kind of looking at its income, um, but it's also debt ratio. It's also what assets do you have and, um, and then, you know, what kind of job you have and what kind of income that's going to provide. Um, can you talk a little bit about how we're using that tool uh, collaboratively? Sure. So the task force created a matrix um, and everybody here today contributed to that significantly. <laughs> and so we look, we look at um, credit scores, levels of credit scores, levels of income, the job availability in the area, transportation, uh, home ownership. And essentially what we've done is create kind of a common language through this matrix where we agree there are needs and disparities that we collectively want to address. And so we're not pegging somebody on this matrix. We're trying to take a look at, all right, where are you on transportation? Where are you with regards to debt ratio and credit scores? Because all of those things are important uh, when somebody wants to look at moving along whatever pathway they've established for themselves. And so it's also a way that to talk to someone, it's also a way to show here's where you are, but here's where you could be. And he, more importantly, here are the things that we need to, to change uh, to make a difference. So maybe it's the access to transportation. So Ridge might be able to say, oh, uh, you know, you've got the job now, but you still need to work a little bit on, on debt, uh, debt ratio, but then you still have a transportation issue. So here's how how you can think about that transportation issue. And maybe I can refer you to driving lives forward, et cetera. So it's helping us look at the common language of how we wanna serve folks together, the, the things, and, and again, it's the essentials of, of life. It's income, it's access to affordable capital, it's access to reliable transportation, access to high quality education and childcare. Um, and then also it's allowing us to determine how we might move forward together sharing data and what are the data points that we wanna collect um, again together so that we can determine how we'll measure progress and how we'll measure success. So um, it really is a tool, again, back to Ridge's notion, it's just a tool, but it's something that we've all agreed on. And so, uh, again, it's key partners. So we have the housing sector, sector represented on the task force. We have employment representative, alternative employment with CIC on the task force, financial literacy, poverty reduction, and then localities, the city and the county. So uh, together as a group of key partners that are working in this uh, financial resiliency area, we believe we might do better if we can look at moving forward together. And so again, that's the key to the matrix is that we've established those key things that an individual will need to consider. And then too, I think uh, in some of our work individually and collectively, it's also just creating hope and, and demonstrating that it can be done. So in our family resiliency program, uh, one our family investment program, sorry about that, one of the things that we thought about as a group is, uh, could we accept someone in the program that's living in public housing? Because again, one of the points that Yolanda made was how does somebody scale out of public housing with losing income, right? Losing services um, and then be able to pivot and make it. And so we've had our first two graduates um, that were in public housing in Charlottesville, actually uh, in the process of graduating from our program. And one looking at, uh, one is moving into the market, purchasing a home, and one is moving into the Habitat Home Ownership Program. And I think it takes that, um, that's one of the things that Habitat and our program was able to demonstrate is there is a pathway. Uh, and, it, and it's just trying to scale those pathways with funding primarily uh, to be able to accomplish um, 
doing that. I think one thing that we all see, and, and maybe um, Rich and Yolanda, you can speak to this too, is we have people that come into our programs that have back to this thing of debt, but not just debt, but very inflated interest rates. I think there was somebody who had gotten a vehicle, Ridge over in Waynesboro, maybe that had like a 200% interest rate on their vehicle. So, um, um, yeah, I'll toss it to I mean, you I just wanted to that. bootstrap off what Yolanda said. So yeah. not only is it hard um, to build the wealth, but there are actors out there that are stripping wealth from mm -hmm. people. Thank you. So yeah. this, this you know, single mom that we were working with had to put her Toyota Sienna minivan up to a title <laughs> company because mm -hmm. she was between jobs and needed the money to, $1,500 to pay the rent. Yeah. Well, by the time she was paying off the $1,500 loan plus the 240% interest rate, she ended up paying $4,106 for that $1,500 that she needed just to keep her and her 12 year old son in the house that they had. Wealth stripping. So right. you can't get to wealth creation when there are people out there trying to strip the very, the little wealth that you do have um, mm -hmm. because you've just hit a bump in the road uh, with your finances. Yeah. It's outrageous. Absolutely. Yeah, we see that quite a bit. We see people that got uh, privatized, you know, college education with outrageous interest rates um, and, and student loans that they're never going to be able to pay off, for example, um, and not even able to use the degree that they, you know, that they work for. It's a common practice. Um, well, I know we're coming up on our time to kind of wrap this conversation up. Um, and you can each kind of answer this individually. You know, we've talked about kind of how your work's making an impact, but, but how do you measure that impact and, and can you measure that impact? Um, I know we grapple with that at United Way um, all the time in terms of how do you measure impact and, and you know, are we making a difference individually and collectively for individuals and families? So uh, Yolanda, I'll let you start again and then we'll just work our way around the panel. Absolutely. So with, uh, within our financial capability program, uh, with, through our coaching process, we obviously do um, a soft pull on folks credit at the beginning. We understand where the debt is. We understand what they have in savings. And then we just measure that. Like, is that, is debt going down? savings going up and his credit score increasing. Um, and what we do is we, we, we're talking with our, um, our partner is what, is what is your goal? What, what are you trying to achieve? Where do you wanna go? What are you trying to get to? And so then what is the plan that, need, that we need to develop to get you there, right? And so it's not, again, it's not about what we feel like that person's credit score should be or what, um, what their debt ratio should be. We know what if they say, well, I want to own a home, well, we say, well, here's what is required to do that in our current system. You got to have this credit score. You got to have this amount of debt to income ratio, and you need to have this much money saved up. So if we, once we understand what their goal is, then we can say, here's what, you know, here's what they're looking for. So now what's the plan to get you there? And so we just measure that and we, we check in and we have um, you know ongoing conversations, um, but we do you know once a month we take a look at it and see where folks are, because at the end of the day you know things can change. You can we can come up with a plan today, and as we know from last year, you know I'm sure a lot of us had a lot of great plans coming into 2020, and then they changed, right? And so we have to constantly check in on that. Excellent. So just this idea too, the importance of coaching, like, you know, having a financial coach, being able to have that person to um, almost accountability to help you keep to your plan and support. Absolutely. And what we like to say is think of it as a team member. Everybody needs team members. Everybody needs mm -hmm. a financial team member, whether it's your coach, whether it's your person that helps you with your taxes, was that banking relationship, everybody along every level of income, you know, needs to have a team and and people that are very wealthy have a lot of people on their team and so if we're looking at how we're going to create wealth then we have to look at what some of those folks do they have team members and we're just here to be a part of that almost like a social network too i mean a lot of us turn to our social networks for introductions for jobs and opportunities in the community and who to turn to for a banker for example who's going to give us a better rate or a better opportunity absolutely. right same idea yep. yeah absolutely um barbara impact? So part of what we do is look at um, how we collaborate. So in Driving Life Explorer, for example, right now the program is still coming out of pilot. And so we're partnering and Network to Work is our primary partner, as is our family investment program and Habitat. So those are the referrals that we're receiving. And again, we're looking at credit score, driving record, um, 
to be able to look at the risk uh, that is involved, but then also uh, to gather enough demographic data to determine that we are um, serving a gap uh, with our transportation, serving the gap with our transportation program. And then over time, we will be checking back in with the family as they're leaving our driving life score program. They've successfully paid for the car and see where they are at that point in time. And our family investment program, same thing. It's tracking all kinds of data, but it's the checkpoint at the end to see where they are at a certain point in time, some years later, to see that this program has made a difference. And, and again, we're seeing some short-term successes buying a home. Um, and so that's a great deal, but not everybody is gonna have that level of short-term success. So what's gonna happen three and four years down the road? So it's figuring out how to go back and check in we're also just looking in our grant making, for example, helping other nonprofits understand that you need to disaggregate your data to be able to determine where there are disparities and, and know that your program is addressing those disparities and therefore it's successful. Uh, but it's not always easy. So in the task force, we wanna share data, but what does that mean? Um, and so we're working collectively to decide what are those data points and uh, how do we know that means success? Um, and again, to Yolanda's point, it's not always what we think, it's what the, it's whom we're serving, the stakeholder, mm -hmm. what is it, what's mm -hmm. success to them? So it may not be home ownership. It may be that someone is earning enough money to meet their expenses and having an emergency savings so they can pivot during a crisis. Uh, but outside of that, they, they're, their necessary necessities of life are being, are being paid for. They've got access to reliable transportation. They have a safe place to live. Um, they're able to meet their other expenses. Um, they don't have excruciating debt. Uh, so it's looking at how that success is being defined with our stakeholder along with us and then gathering the appropriate data to be able to report it. Um, and that's, um, you know, it, that's the key to me to be able to say that we've achieved success. Well, and making adjustments as needed as we learn and, and being humble about the whole Absolutely. thing. Because we certainly do not have all the answers. Absolutely. Right? We're looking to our clients Absolutely to kind not. of guide us and like, yeah, how do we help them meet their desired goals? Um, Ridge, talk a little bit about impact. In my in my 30 seconds, I'm going to say, given that we think that um, <laughs> that that the, the racial wealth gap is driven by the, the unequal labor income, our focus is on uh, are our job seekers making substantial income gains? And so that is our either yes or no. Yes, they are, or no, they're not. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's our primary metric. And, but we also report out uh, what percentage of our job seekers are single parents because they tend to be um, uh, disconnected or um, distrustful of the systems. And so we, we're trying to keep an eye on those single parents to make sure that they don't get left behind. And we're also keeping an eye on the racial makeup of the people that we serve to make sure that we are meeting uh, equity goals and that we are intentionally reaching out to people who have uh, similarly been intentionally left uh, to the side of the road in our economy. So that's what that's our metric. Absolutely. And, and briefly, can you just talk about kind of the investment it takes to help a family get ahead? You and I had that conversation just recently. Yeah. So this is just our our cost. So this doesn't count like what the United Way might throw in for a, you know, a child care scholarship. But but on average, it costs about twenty seven hundred dollars for us to move somebody from where they are to a job that pays between twenty five and thirty thousand dollars a year. Absolutely. So and we're working on that collectively to figure out as a task force, what do we what do we do to pull our resources together in terms of, of looking at that cost factor? So we kind of have a sense of, um, is it 20,000 a family? Is it 40,000? Know, what is it that we need to do to, to kind of work together and what kind of investment does that look like? Um, at any rate, that kind of concludes the panel today. I, I know we ran over, but it was a good conversation. I didn't want to um, stop before I felt like we, we got it all in. So. Um, if there's any quick questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, otherwise, we are all here to talk to folks here in the community. Um, I think our contact information was provided as part of the panel today. And certainly you can get that through Ben Wilkes at the TomTom Tom Foundation. And uh, it was a pleasure to be here and share some of our work, our collaboration, our experience, and our passion um, for this issue and the subject here in our community. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks.